So, once again, we would like to thank John Dunlap and Train for providing us dinner. Thank you, John. Now, you would think that we had actually planned this and set this up accordingly, um, but actually we scheduled Doug Hampton, who is also from Train, um, to speak tonight completely separately, completely independently from uh, John joining us and uh, Bob's presentation. So it's really interesting. Doug Hampton is a friend of mine. Um, he has, oh, what, about 24 years industry experience at this point, give or take. Okay, we met back at the point when we were still both sitting on buckets working in the field, um, working on construction sites, um, engineering, commissioning, um, doing controls. So we've been working together for quite a while. Um, Doug comes from a background of uh, technical education at um, Milford, um, uh, sorry, our competitor uh, in this vicinity, Southeast Community College. Um, at that time, um, they had the best um, HVAC program in the state. Um, so he came from great training, um, did residential and refrigeration initially, then got into commercial, and then from there got into controls. Um, he decided to leave train at one point and went to work for an engineering firm as a commissioning agent. Um, and you were there for, what, about six years? Seven years? Okay. Um, but they were local here in town. And then he decided to go back to train a handful of years ago um, and is now in charge, or not in charge, sorry, one of their leads on doing data analytics and selling in energy projects. Would that be reasonably accurate? Close enough. So I would like you to welcome, oh, uh, Doug is also one of my adjuncts um, here at the college. So he has decided to come back and you know put his money where his mouth is, which we know so few people from our industry are actually willing to do. You know, they acknowledge we need people, we need people, we want your best. Okay, well, show up to the classroom, teach, and you'll get to pick the best out of whatever classes you teach. So it's, a, you know, for us, it's an 11-week job interview. Only Doug has been the only industry person of late who's actually joined us. And I say of late, but really he's been one of my adjuncts for three and a half years, four years at this point. So if everyone would please welcome... Doug Hampton. I'm gonna do my best behind a podium. I, I like to move around a lot, so if I if I start walking off the top without the mic, uh, you'll have to remind me to do that because I'm, I'm told that this is recorded for posterity or for whatever other reason. But I, I appreciate the intro, Robert, and Robert and I have known each other for a very long time, so. And when you talk about vetting employees and, and uh, vetting uh, coworkers and things like that, that's uh, exactly true. So um, as far as what I'm going to talk about today, I'm a data guy. I like charts and graphs. Anybody who doesn't like charts and graphs in the house because I'm a data guy. If you ask me how much data I want, I'm going to say all of it. <laughs> but my coworkers like to give me a hard time about that. Now I'm gonna make some presumptions that we all understand how automation systems work, but I'm gonna review it just briefly. How Air Handler VAV, I understand that you've had some Air Handler VAV stuff today, if not before that. We're also gonna get into some optimizations, what you can take back to your facilities. You have your own labs that you get to be in every day. Take some of these ideas back to your building, show them to your students, however it might work out. And a part of that is scheduling out from the start, area control, which you'll all understand more as I get going here, and using that data to prioritize service. Introduction into energy conservation using that data, analytics, and especially metering. And of course, conclusions, take takeaways, and, and I want this to be interactive. I'm an instructor, so I might call on you. You just never know when I'm gonna call on you. Might just be Robert all the time, but that's okay. He knows what I'm talking about. Many, any, any questions or uh, uh, you might have at the time. So, 
I was talking to uh, Robert, and he says, there's this guy from Trey going to be there. I'm like, well, who is that from? That's got to be me, right? He says, no, this, this guy from Chicago, John Dunlap. I'm like, okay. So I called John. He's like, yeah, I'm going to be there, and, and then we're going to sponsor the dinner. And I'm like, you mean I can wear my train gear, and I don't have to make all my train slides agnostic like I typically do? But that being said, I am not a salesperson. I am a solutions provider. So when it comes to the sales side, if, if you feel like there's any sales stuff in here, that's just me. Train wash, as we like to call it. I've been in the train long enough. But I was a commissioning authority out in the world, so I did get to see a lot of other systems out there. And you're going to see some questions that pop up about other vendors. Train as a vendor. The hardware is hardware. Software is software. I'm going to talk more about the software side. And... I often get asked, well, Doug, why are you showing all this stuff? Our competitors could be in the crowd. I'm like, well, basically, I'm showing you the painting. I'm not showing you how I painted it. So there's a million ways to get to the, to the end result, and I'm just going to show you that. Now, as far as teaching, Robert went in on a little bit of why I do it. I love to give back. I love to, to help my students Miss some of the, the holes that I stepped in along the way. Here's some things that I learned along the way. And it's also how to treat each building holistically. As a technician, I've done it myself. You get tunnel vision. Here's a machine you need to work on, a problem you need to fix. I'll go fix that problem, not paying any attention to what's happening in the rest of the building. So what I really tell my students is to be holistic. Look at the entire building. Yes, that machine may have an issue. There may be a complaint there. But it might not be relevant to what you're working on. It might be something else in the building that might impact that. So here's our basic building automation review. We're just going to look at some system architecture. Any guesses as to who the parent company is for this one? But anyway, uh, basically, uh, everybody's the same anymore. And the way I look at this, our controls a commodity now. I think they sure can be, or in many regards are. As far as the integration goes, integration versus interoperation, most control centers can do that now. So when it comes to controls as a commodity, hardware, and the reason I'm talking about this, is when bid time comes, it's not necessarily that low bid that we really worry about. It's what's behind that controls. Sure, this vendor can sell this controller to me for cheaper than I can get it anywhere else, but what's behind it? Who is behind it? Are there technicians that have the ability or they, do they have a long reputation that they've been around a lot? Any questions on this slide, Robert? Did I get that one right? Okay. I like that. I think you do. A variable error system review. I understand that you, you did some discussions today about variable error systems, right? Yeah? But as far as sequence of operation, hardware versus software? Very minimal. Very minimal. Okay. Or lab experience. Good. The lab experience is great. OGAT is always the best way. So as far as variable error systems review, I'm going to break this down and make it real simple. This particular package DX rooftop air conditioner can be a, an air handler. It can use DX, which is air conditioners, compressors. It can use chilled water systems. It can be a part of many other machines in that facility. But for all intent and purpose that we're going to talk about today, this air handler has one purpose. Cooling. 55 degrees, one and a half inches water column. That's the presumption we're going to make for this presentation. Now, a VAD box <coughs> presumes that 55, that it's cooling. It also needs at least one inch static pressure. It does not know or care what the static pressure is. Does not know or care what the air temperature is. Now, as far as what other things that rooftop air handler can do, yes, it can do a morning warm up, pre-cool, night heat cool, and there's a whole bunch of other things. But for today, we're just going to presume that that rooftop or air handler is doing cooling. And then the VADs are responsible for what's happening out in the space. Now, this particular building here dynamically has a lot of different things going on. For instance, 
can see my pointer there. Okay, probably should have turned on the laser for that. But anyways, this one here, as you can see, has a, a store, it's got windows, it's on the bottom floor. During the summer times, probably gonna get a little hotter. During the winter times, probably gonna get a little cooler than, than the rest of the building. Up here on the top floor, top floor and the bottom floor are completely different dynamics, completely different spaces, right? So if we're highly dependent on a machine that is providing 55 degrees at one and a half inches, how are we gonna heat this floor? How are we gonna cool this floor at the same time? Well, let's talk about different types of VABs. Now, I, I, I know I'm making some assumptions here about what you talked about today as far as VABs go. If you have questions, you wanna talk about it now, you wanna talk about it later, I'm, I'm okay either way. Now, as far as cooling element, highly dependent on the air handler, 55 degrees, one inch. It just has a small air valve in there. But what if we wanna reheat that air? What if we want to heat that room up? What if it needs heat and the room next to it doesn't? We can simply take that cooling VAB and we can add a coil to it. That coil can be hot water, that coil can be electric, and that way we are no longer dependent on the rooftop to provide heat. We know it's doing 55 and one inch, now we can provide heat to that specific space and we'll call that reheat. Now, there's also fan-powered boxes, series-powered boxes, and parallel-powered boxes. I'm not gonna get too deep into these, but for all, for all the things we're talking about today, continuous fan and cycling with heat. Now I'm gonna back up to that slide we were just looking at before to talk about this. Now let's say that this one on the bottom floor needs heat in the middle of the night. And what if there's 50 VAB boxes on this, this particular air handler, but only one of them, this one down here that has all the glass needs heat. Should we start the air handler up, run the air handler to provide air for this particular box? We don't have to do that. What if we could use a box on this level that could provide its own air? Wasn't dependent on the air handler. It could provide its own heat. Well, in that case, we can use either one of these. We can use a series box, or we can use a parallel box. The only difference between the two is, a series box runs its fan all the time. It's to guarantee a specific CFM. Let's say that I have an exhaust fan in a hospital room, and I want to have a constant supply fan. I would do that. With parallel box, it only runs the fan when it needs heat. So if we go back to this scenario here, we could simply put that parallel fan box down here when it needs heat, turns on the fan, turns on the heat, and does not have to supply air to the entire system. So the reason I'm showing you this is you know this now and you didn't know it two minutes ago. So it's always good to ask questions, ask your HVHEC specialist. Mr. Robin over here is a wealth of knowledge. <clears throat> Now, as far as the variable air system review, now we know more about this VAB system than we did five minutes ago. We only know what we know. And educate ourselves, ask the right questions. Okay, what's the best way to save energy in a building? The most energy, I can just go shut the breaker off to the building. I'll save a lot of energy. <laughs> we all know that that doesn't work. Now, there's, there's people in that building who require comfort, we need ventilation, all these things. We have the ability now to do all these things and automate them. As far as this goes, there's always a hierarchy of how things happen in the system. You think it would be easy enough, I'm just gonna make a schedule and I'm just gonna put all my equipment in that schedule, start up all at the same time. Well, that's great unless we have demand charges and then all of our building starts up and our electrical company says, wait a minute, you're going to pay for that. Okay, well, we can't do that. Well, what if we, uh, what if we need to have the building comfortable by 8 a.m.? It's really cold outside. I better start it at 5, just to make sure that I get comfortable by 5 a.m. But what if I forget? Now my building's starting at 5 a.m. every day, but it's really nice outside. So there's a lot of technology built into uh, uh, controllers, not necessarily just trains. 
Uh, these are, are fairly agnostic things. I'm showing you the trade way because that's what I know. So there's a hierarchy. There is a time-based control. When do you want stuff to start is on top. So we decide when to start, when to shut off, and that's it. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., let's just say that for, for hypothetical conversation here. Now we have what's called area control, which is temperature-based. And if this doesn't seem clear right now, it will. I'm just gonna lay out the, the groundwork here. Temperature-based and humidity-based control. So we have our top hierarchy, scheduling, talks to an area, and then that area controls light tank equipment. That could be VAD boxes, it could be space comfort controllers like heat pumps, individual rooms, whatever that equipment might be, it doesn't really matter. Now, we're gonna throw a wrench into this because now we're gonna start talking about the VAD systems. So we have our schedule, we have our area, and we have all of our spaces below that. Now we're gonna talk about how we control that with an area. It's not as simple as you might think. Now, unfortunately, it can be quite complicated unless you're Robert and can do this stuff in his sleep. Anyways, so when we talk about the hierarchy, scheduling talks to areas, areas talk to VAD boxes, but the VAD box does not talk to the rooftop or to the area. There's software in the middle called variable error system, and that's not just training. Everybody does that, and I'm going to get into a little bit more detail. This picture, just think about the four different layers here. We have schedules, areas, spaces, and then we have our rooftop stuff. Okay, time of day schedule. Now, this is a pretty basic. We have our occupancy schedule. In this case, this one's 5.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it looks like it's the administration area. This is an optimal start window. What does this mean? Well. I am saying that I want my building to be satisfied by 5.30 a.m. But I'm going to also say you get a two-hour optimal start window to start whenever you want to based on outside air temperature. So the days of trying to predict what the weather patterns might be, those days are over. We just say, okay, air control, you're going to look at the outside air temperature, the average space temperature, the space temperature set point of that space. And it's gonna calculate all that stuff and say, okay, based on the history of how this space is working, the last time it was 50 degrees outside, it took me 30 minutes to get satisfied by, by creating. Now it's 50 degrees, I'm gonna start 30 minutes early to make sure I get there. Well, what if it's really cold? Maybe I'll start two hours early. Maybe it's really mild outside. Maybe I only need to start at 5.30. So that technology is there. I'm teaching you that because that's something, if it's not used now, is probably one of the most overlooked features of automation systems. Now, history is important. Um, I, I always tell folks it's, it's important to understand that if I start optimal start today, it's not going to work just today. It needs a little bit of history to, to get things going. I hear that all the time. Well, I, I enabled my optimal start, now it's not doing anything. Well, give it some time. It's those algorithms need to, to factor in. Here we go, charts and graphs. Robert smiling. Anyway, so as far as our, our area control goes, we have to consider garbage in, garbage out. Like any computer. I've programmed some things and I looked at it several years later and I was like, who did this? And then I see my name at the bottom of it. It's like, okay, what was I thinking that day? And you can't tell me you've never done that. <laughs> anyway, so on the left here, we have our, our modes. Unoccupied, which means off. Occupied, which means on. And then we have optimal start here. And then on the right, we have temperature. So let's, let's add in some data. We see what the mode is doing. It goes from unoccupied, goes into an optimal start mode, and then hits the occupied for the entire day. So what we have here is we have our max temperature of the space, we have our minimum temperature of the space, and then we have our average. Well, if you're looking at this data, there's a lot to take away from here. Number one, 
we have a 26 minute optimal start, which means based on the outside air temperature, it needed to start 26 minutes early to get happy by whatever its occupied start time. But look at this. It took three hours, an additional three hours for that space to get comfortable. Okay, so why did it not start two hours, three hours early? Well, garbage in, garbage out. It's taking the max and the min and creating an average. So if I have 35 units, 35 VAB boxes, heat pumps, whatever, it's using the average temperature to calculate when it starts. So in this case, since there's so many members in here, its average was washed out. So in this case, this space here took an additional three hours to get there. Now, the, the common response to that is, well, I better probably schedule my stuff earlier to start. You see it all the time. This space is not comfortable, or it gets overrated on it all the time. So it's a matter of us looking at the data, programming things in a good way so we can get it done. So how do we do that? We have a specific building here, and often when control folks program it, they just dump everything into <coughs> one schedule and it gets left that way. So here's a, a typical building. And again, you, you all have living labs at, at home that probably air handler VABs, I would imagine if they're a commercial building. So in this case, how do we divide this stuff up? Do we start the entire building at one time? Not necessarily. What if we break the building up into smaller pieces? We have our northern exposure, we have our eastern exposure, we have a production area over here, and then we have our interior spaces. So think about that. If you put all these spaces in one schedule in one area, the northern exposure in the, sun, in the wintertime is going to be colder than the interior. Why would we want to start those out at the same time? So in this case, what we can do is we can group these together. And then we can say optimal start. You get two hours to start, or four hours, however long you want to go, to start this area to be happy by whatever your occupied start time is. The same with the interior. The interior, uh, depending on what's in there, if, the, if it's computer spaces or stuff like that, it's probably gonna be the last space that we need to start. Now, I made a comment earlier about demand, starting things all at the same time. Not only is it expensive to do that, but it's hard on our infrastructure. Think if you're providing chilled water for all those air handlers not just electrically, compressors and things like that. But now we're really hitting our infrastructure for building really hard. What if we staggered it, stair-stepped it? Instead of starting everything at one time, let's move things out a little bit. So now we're starting this, this particular area first, second, third, fourth, easing into the day. And then maybe by the time this northern zone is happy, Maybe it's backed off a little bit. So it, it's a good way to stair-step our building so we're not slamming everything so hard. Now we're getting into the meat and the potatoes. Anybody sleeping yet? I don't see anybody sleeping yet. So think about data points. Let's just say an air handler has 60 points in it. That's probably a little, little low. Let's call it 100 points, 60 points, whatever. VABs, let's say there's 40 points inside in I.O. Inputs, outputs, analog, binary, whatever they might be. So we say one air handler and 100 VABs has approximately 460 points. Now what if we're collecting that data every 15 minutes? Yes, sir? The math's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Oh, okay. Fair enough. 4,600 points. <laughs> Fair enough. Anyways, thank you, Mike. You're always watch me. It actually be looks better that way. So what do you do with all that data? If we're saving it all the time, it used to be it was the data wasn't quite as as vast as it is now. So you could take that data, you could put it in spreadsheets, do charts and graphs, and figure it out. Now it's so vast, there's just in, it's impossible for us to sort through that data. And as our controllers have evolved, they've gotten faster. We're moving more data now. Our software's evolved. It's given us a real good opportunity to take that data and use it for us. And think about what, what would you really care about in a, in a VAB box? Space temperature versus set point, airflow versus 
airflow set point, all these things, what about, what if it's got a filter? What if it's heating too fast or not heat fast enough? All these things, you could do what ifs all day. Try to write those out with them, times 40, 600 points or whatever it is. But what if that building had 10 air handlers and 1,000 water boxes? So you kind of see where I'm going here. The data is just so vast. Uh-oh, new chart. So what we do, think about all that data. What are we going to do with it? Well, let's write an algorithm. Let's say we're going to watch our airflow. Airflow instability. That makes sense. It's providing airflow, but maybe a little unstable. Well, why do we care about that? Why do we care about airflow instability? Why do we care about ineffective airflow or a star VAD box? Well, I'm going to dig into that just a little bit. But let's say that we have this airflow instability algorithm is, is written for one box times a thousand boxes, getting data every 15 minutes. It's impossible again for us to figure that out. So what we do is we look at that data over its life, over its time, and say, this is our algorithm. Anytime that we step outside of what we would consider normal operation, we're going to give it an exception. It's going to get a box check. And what we're going to do then is we're going to look at that data over a 100-day period. Now, let's say that, that that particular box has airflow instability 10 times a day. All we care about is that it's doing it. We're going to give it one vote per day. So looking at this chart, if we're looking at data over 100 days and we know we get at least one vote per day, let's break it into a, a percentage. Let's look at this box here. 79 days out of 100 days, it had issues with airflow instability. 79% of the time, it was not working. Now, as far as the, the algorithms go, this is three or exceptions. This is three of 30. There's a whole bunch of them. I didn't want to flood, flood the, the screen with all sorts of stuff. There's enough colors up here as it is. So airflow instability. You've got one that's, that's uh, shown its head at 79%. We have another couple boxes here that's doing ineffective airflow. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference between ineffective airflow and airflow instability? Like I said before, garbage in, garbage out. It's up to us to interpret that, what that means. Ineffective airflow control means it gets its proper airflow but doesn't do anything with it. It's not satisfying the space. Airflow instability means that it gets there, but it's all over the place. Now we have another couple here that are triggered exceptions for star VAD boxes, which means they never get airflow. So you're starting to see a trend here to where these VAD boxes, out of 55 VAD boxes, these are the ones that are a problem. Now it used to be if I had an air handler VAD system and I was having issues with it, I would need to hire a controls guy, a test and balance person, go through and recommission the entire thing. Tens of thousands of dollars to do that. In this case, I can simply say, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to service these outlier boxes and everything should come back into line. And I'm gonna show you some more data that supports that. Now this is another chart, love charts. I know I can, I can tell everybody loves charts. But anyway, this one is very simple. This is the, the valve position, the air valve position of all the VAV boxes served by this air handler. Do I really care what they are, what their names? I do not. I care about where the average is you can see right here, it's about all the VAV boxes are sitting here about 35%. You can see this huge spike on startup too, can't you? Now we're looking at all the VAV boxes. They spike when they start. They all start at the same time. But when they come down here to normal, they're about 30 35% open. There's that startup peak. Here is the happy spot. Think about an analog gauge. An analog gauge is most accurate in that middle one-third. It's true with VAV boxes as well. We want those to be right in the middle. As you can see, the average is right at the bottom of that lower control range. Now, why do I care? If they're at the bottom of that control range, they tend to be noisy because they're starting to pinch down that air. And we see now, based on this chart, we've got outliers. Those boxes that we just saw 
all that harvested data, we've got one that's open all the time, and we've got a couple down here that are really closed out. What do I need to do to this VAB system to get it right? Well, actually, this actually looks quite good because you only have two or three VAB boxes that are that are out of out of kilter, if you will. So to reduce my fan energy and all these other things, all I have to do is now fix these three boxes. That is the power of data. So what else can we do? What can we do the, with those boxes? What if, if we look in this scenario, we know which ones have failed, we can fix those boxes, but what else can we do with energy? We can fix our, our boxes, we can prioritize our service. As a service person, I would get a list of stuff here, you go fix the stuff and you show up. Charge customer, you write up your, your work order. Off you go. Complaints, alarms. That's what a lot of people have time for. They don't have time to be proactive. This gives us the ability to be proactive and to prioritize service at the same time. So now we can say here, Mr. Service Guy, here's a, a list of things we can do proactively now instead of fix on fail, which is always expensive. What else can we do? Energy conservation, duct pressure optimization, that's a whole other class on its own. We'll let Robert do that one for us. Discharge your temperature reset. Now think about this. This air handler was created for the hottest day of the year. 2% is what it was created for. The rest of the time, we don't need that much capacity, do we? We have the ability to use that data now to turn that equipment down. We can use duct pressure optimization to reduce the fan speed. We can use discharge air temperature reset to reduce the temperature into the box. Why give it 55 degrees and then reheat it up to 80 if we need to satisfy that space? Go from 55 up to, or from 70 up to 85 or something like that. Critical zone reset, that is, remember the outlier that I showed you back on this chart? What if I can speed my air handler up to satisfy that one specific box? Would I need to do that? Not necessarily, but I have the power to do that. Energy conservation leader. More fun stuff. Now, like I said, I'm an instructor, so if I see anybody nodding off, I definitely will call on you. Robert's smiling at me again. He says, don't do it, please. Anyway. Are we allowed to drink in class? <laughs> please do. <laughs> Anyways, so we talked about VABs, a lot of boring stuff. I get that. Is it weird that it excites me? I really enjoy data. Anyways, so data. Let's talk about meters. Everybody gets one of these. Everybody gets 12 data points a year when it comes to utilities, right? What if I can have a meter in my building and I can monitor that every 15 minutes? Now, Looking back at this chart, June and July, it looks like I'm using more energy in June and July. Well, that's the peak of the heating season. That's not a huge surprise. But what did I do in those two months? Did I use too much that I did before? Did I use less? I'm still using a lot, but how does it compare to the history of my building? I often get asked, well, I can't afford to put a meter in my building. You don't necessarily have to get one. It may already be there. Lots of buildings have meters in them already. It's just a matter of communicating to that meter. And honestly, meters aren't overly expensive anyway for what you get. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. It's about resolution. Think about watching a, a show on standard definition TV. Remember when they sometimes they'll show older TV and it's like this big in your screen and it's still fuzzy and hard to see it? It's all about resolution, okay? So we're moving into the high definition range here. We're going from 12 data points to 35,000 data points. Now you can see every one of these little boxes means 15 minutes. Now we can see a profile of our building. When does it start? When does it stop? How are we scheduling? Was there a bigger load that day? How was the temperature? So that resolution is important. And it also helps us as technicians to help prevent a lot of those hard going starts or to stagger those starts. Or we have running equipment at night and we didn't know it. 
Utility data also is important. How do we set goals if we don't know where we were or where we want to go? Now, looking at this, I just told you that 35,000 data points is better than 12. Yeah, I, I have a quick question about utility data. Yeah. How is part meter time? Mm -hmm. Are you finding any type of cooperation with utility in order to just grab the data? With their zero count time? It depends. So yes and no. Kind of I would say that. Well, how's it working out? I mean, are they pretty cooperative? Uh, yeah, for the most part. So we have mutual customers. So when it comes to working with utilities, they do have some competing technology. But as far as that goes, we do things differently. It's, it's really apples and oranges. So we get a lot of cooperation. Now, more than we have in the past, that's a very good question. Now, as far as the, the data points go, yeah, the, the 15 minute interval data is awesome. But we still need to look at your actual goals. Everybody really should do this. Uh, you can do it. I can help you do it, show you how to do it. Energy Star is free. I can show you how to set that up. Robert and I were actually talking about doing some webinars in the future on different things. So uh, he, can, he can ping you guys and see what kind of thing you want to learn about. And if utility data is one of them, I can sure show you how to do that. Energy Star. Anyways, so we're looking at a couple different things. We're looking at energy use intensity. How much energy are we using KVTUs per square foot? And we compare that to how the rest of your like type buildings are doing. Now this particular commercial building is using 48 and a half KVTUs per square foot. So how do we compare that? Well, in this case, this is where the building started. Its design was right about in here. And it did, did start out really well and they reduced a lot of their costs and then all of a sudden things just went crazy. They started using a lot of data, couldn't figure out why. And along with that, you can see the little blue line, the light blue line comes right along with it. Energy cost, dollars per square foot. And you can see here, this is, uh, this is where we started with our program, but you can see the costs are starting to flip because costs are getting more expensive. Gas is getting more expensive. Energy is not gonna get cheaper. It'd be great if it did, I hope it does. Yes, sir. Done any calculation, this one's for Peter, uh, heat pumping out. Because it's interesting when you talk about peak loading and stuff, but now you're gonna create in the middle of the night a different peak. And you're gonna shift it down to, you know, obviously yeah. electrification. Electrification for I mean, has anybody done have you read the studies or seen any of that or sure, yeah, and that is infrastructure is is an issue because we're all electrification of things and decarbonizing and things like that. In a lot of cases, our, our infrastructure just can't handle it. Thermal storage is a big part of that. Yeah, you have storage units. Yeah. yeah. And there is a lot of incentives now and tax rebates and things like that that can help you use thermal storage. Basically, what you're doing is you're putting tanks somewhere and you're storing ice or you're storing water. And uh, I believe... I, I don't want to get into it too deep, but 1879D is, a, is something you can certainly ask about, and they pay huge tax incentives for that. It's not a rebate, it's a tax break. Anyway, more charts. What do we care about data for? Well, if we look at this, we know that we did a good job as far as this particular school goes or this particular building. I'm looking at the entire history of the building here. All the data, all the 15 minute interval data, what am I looking at? I'm looking at demand, but I'm also seeing a peak. I set that peak, I had to pay 12 months for what that peak was. I see my baseline, this is as low as my building operates. This is what I wanna see, I wanna see what my baseline is. And also, I'm gonna see when my baseline increases. Is there stuff running when it should be? These are things that we can see with 50 minute interval data that we cannot see with those 12 points of data. We can also break it down. If you're getting that data, you can break it down as fine as you want. You want to turn on a fan to see what its KW is? You've got a meter on site, you can do that. In this case, we're looking at a week now where we can see the building when it starts. We can also see a whole bunch of cycling at night. Now, is cycling costing us money? Maybe not. Maybe it's just wear and tear our foot. These are all things that we can see and be proactive with our building. 
What is this? Yes, sir. The first smart meters that uh, Metro installed on their own campus led us to finding a uh, pair of 40 ton compressors that were short cycling. They were cycling on and off about every three minutes. And we can see that on the energy bill. It's really interesting. Now, this, this data here, this is the charts we're used to. One line, X and Y. What if we can take that 50 minute interval data and we can put it on a color spectrum, see it from a different perspective? We have our time of day over here on the left, and we have our date time on the bottom, and we have demand. Green is good, red is bad. Well, you see a, a definite profile on there, don't you? We can see when our building starts, we can see weekends, we can see when things are starting early, we can see when somebody put in an old ride they weren't supposed to. We can see when scheduling was increased. This gives us, oh, we can also see where we reduced the schedule quite a bit. Can't we? That made a huge difference there, didn't it? And that was back in 22, last year. We can also look, drill it down, look into the, we can see our <coughs> start, we can see our cycling, and right in here, we can actually see when our optimal start happens. It was cool on that day. It starts a little early on a Monday. You can see it starts a little earlier on every Monday. More charts and graphs. This one is a 3D graph, Robert. Like this one. Anyway, 50 minute interval data again. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that chart to analyze the data even further. Why would we get so deep? I mean, we already showed you 35,000 data points. What if I can make your building go from this, look at all these peaks, you can start the building, see the building start, and then just kind of idle, and then it starts up again. Why do we need to run it at night? Why do we need to start so early? Basically, it's just another way to analyze the data. And this was just summer winter breaks for some setback. We did some scheduling in the off hours. Overrides is a big deal. We always want to review overrides as often as we can. Monthly, quarterly, whatever that might be. <clears throat> and then of course, we cut the peaks off quite a bit. Now as far as energy conservation measures that you can take with you, reduce those run times, schedule, always look at schedules, area diversification, optimal start, VAV, prioritize service, duct pressure optimization, the list goes on and on and on. I'm not even getting into the chiller stuff. So that's something we can talk about as well. Robert, when you were out of the room, I had mentioned that we were thinking about doing some webinars on these various subjects, and we can talk about that at a later date. But in conclusion, data can be agnostic. It doesn't just have to be training or any other method. Now I want you to know what to ask for. What data do you need? What is your goal? What do you want to do with that data? Is it to reduce comp complaints. Maybe you don't care as much about the energy side of it or the cost side of it. Or is it energy? Are there other mandates maybe coming from above that say you need to reduce your consumption by X? And the data can not only help you do that, but it can give you a before and an after. This is what our complaints were before we did this program. We started looking at our data. This is what it looks like now to help you look good. And how do you want it to work for you? That's the, the biggest thing I can say is performance and validation. What are your goals for the data and how are, am I gonna validate it? If I have a solution for you, I'm not just gonna hand you a list of problems. There's plenty of vendors out there, plenty of energy folks that'll hand you a list of, of issues and say, good luck, have a nice day. Ask for a solution and validation for that. Now, as far as more training, chill plants, analysis, optimization, and thermal imaging, which I've done, I think, two years ago, maybe, or last year. I don't remember which one it was for sure. <laughs> Might have been. Anyway, questions? Is there, is there any uh, outsider help for data orders? <laughs> you mean like Google? <laughs> I can't control what they do. Now, we don't use our data nefariously. We use it for, for the greater good. 
Well, what, what is it you're, you're um, referring to? Specifically? You're saying people that have a problem with data that have too much of it can't collect it enough? Um, well, there, there are... <coughs> sometimes it's hard to get the data. Sometimes I, I hear all the time, well, that's mine. I, I don't want to give it to you. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I, I will show you how to use it to your advantage. We do. That is that is a, a different vertical market that we have. We do struggle with that because it they, they talk on mod base typically, which is a, a completely different protocol. But they have different mandates. They don't necessarily care so much about energy as they do downtime. So what we do then is we use the analytics to help them prevent downtime. We can see a motor that's that's starting to pull more KW than it did before. Let's move into some other programs. Let's get it for thermal imaging and vibration analysis and things like that. Combine all those things together to prevent downtime. Anybody else? Over here. Yes, sir. You said right at the beginning that controls are a commodity now. I believe they are, yeah. And, and what do you mean by that? Well, if I want to control an area, but I can buy a controller from just about any vendor, anywhere that can talk to anybody else. And when I talk about the hardware being a commodity, is that there, there are certain vendors that you can buy controls from just about anywhere. And then if you have the ability to program that yourself, you can certainly do that. And lots of vendors have open licensing where anybody can service that particular equipment. So now it's not so much about the pieces and parts, it's about who's sitting on the bucket doing the programming. Who's the remote service tech on the other end of the phone that has the, that 35, 40 years of experience that's going to help you out with that product? If you buy it, if I buy a controller off of eBay, I get zero support. That's kind of what I'm trying to say is you can, you can buy the hardware just about anywhere you want to uh, sit behind it. Good question. <laughs> well, I can do an analysis, and it looks like there's quite a few empty glasses, so I don't say bring it back. Anyway, I hope it didn't bore you. I, I, I really enjoy this stuff. If you have any questions at all, if you want to dig into your specific buildings, it doesn't have to be trained stuff. We can look at any building, anywhere. Okay, Robert, I'll turn it back over to you. Larry? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. One question about the graphic user interface. Uh, how has trains from an effort along those lines made it easier for the technician and other staff to be able to you know, understand what they're looking at? Because Robert mentioned earlier, right, he thought that Frank had done an exceptional job. So I just want to hear more of it. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get into more detail. And I think the best way to, to talk about that would be to talk about what we call Train Connect. So everybody remember when the, the target pack thing years ago was like one of the biggest first data breaches that we had? That was blamed on an HVAC company, when in fact, it was an HVAC employee that had a VPN and used it nefariously. It wasn't the software. It was a, a malicious attack internally. So at that point in time, many vendors had lots of different ways to connect. I mean, some of them were still dial up, some of them were VPN, some of them were static IP addresses on the internet, of all things. So at that point in time, a trade of many vendors decided we're not going to do that anymore. So instead of having all those connecting abilities, we have one connection ability now. And it goes from your site to Amazon Web Services, back down to you, anywhere in the world, um, using Train Connect. And what that does is it takes away the identity of that IP address. They handle all that security for us. So uh, that is, is one thing we do. And all that data we're talking about, 50 minute interval data, all that stuff is stored there at Train Connect. It's free for everybody. If you want it, I can sign you up for it and you can look at it. That's something we took a, a huge step back years ago. Yes, sir. 
you were showing us uh, what I think it was something like 540 points for Eric Handler and PAB Bob. And uh, 15 minute intervals in a 24 hour period is thousands and thousands of data points. Correct. And you said, okay, well, let's write an algorithm and boil that down. And you, you kind of made a a jump there. Okay. So what are we going to do? How are we going to write that algorithm? What, out of all those tens of thousands of data points, what are we going to look at? It's a very good question. And I did jump in. I started talking about exceptions to the normal operation. Let's take a case space comfort controller, for, for, for example, a heat pump could be a DAE. Our purpose is to make that space comfortable. At, at the bottom line, we give it a set limit, let's say it's 70 degrees, and we want it to stay there. We also want to provide ventilation for that room. Now, this particular room here is sized for all of us. However many people are here breathing, and ventilation from outside is coming into this room. And capacity has gone up to we're trying to maintain the temperature. Do we really know if it's doing it as well as it did the last time? Or the day before that? Or the day before that? Think about our, our air conditioners in our house. Well, we know they don't work. We get hot. But do we really know if it ran 25 seconds longer today than it did the day before? Or last year? The algorithms I'm talking about would be based on our concerns. Comfort. What's it fit comfort? And we know that we have a set point. How far above that set point did it deviate? How far below it did it deviate? And how far did it happen every day for the last year or so? It gives us an opportunity to see that trend over the history. Okay, now this piece of equipment started to deviate a little bit more every day. But we figured that a building drifts considerably, 10 to 15% a year. So if we see that coming, that's one algorithm that we can look at. Oh, what if it's ventilation? I know that I need to provide a specific amount of ventilation based on the actuary standards. How are we doing with that ventilation? Are we ventilating over ventilating? Are we under ventilating? That's another one that we can talk about. Uh, is the, the reading core performing the way it's supposed to? Is it getting too hot too fast? Is it not heating up the way it's supposed to? Is it opening further now than it did yesterday? Those are all those things that and when you talk about what is and what those algorithms could be, I mean, you could, you could write what is all as long as you wanted to. And if we're getting into bigger machines, let's say there's four or six compressors in a, in a unit, there's a ton of stuff to talk about there. We're talking about chiller plants and things like that. So when I'm talking about all those tens of thousands of points, if I was to write an algorithm and put it into my controller, what would my output? I don't know, I don't have the power to do that. That's why we, we write an algorithm and say, this algorithm is going to apply to all these PAV boxes, and the data is going to come, and it's going to be parsed for us. Me as a, as a data analyst, I don't want to spend my time writing algorithms and going collecting the data and putting it into charts. I just want to look at the charts. Does that make sense? So it's really on the interpretation of what that data looks like coming back at us, what we do with it. But nobody likes code, they like blocks. <laughs> so yeah. are, are, are we generating a lot of data that we don't want to look at? It, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's lots of data in there that might not be relevant for us, but that's for us to interpret that. We're trying to change our job. Yeah, we may, get, uh, we may get a whole bunch of exceptions for things that might not be relevant to us, but that could be relevant to a, a different market. And what you said about the, the block programming is huge. Think about any way that's written programming in Langford, words, commas, parentheses. I remember sitting on a bucket trying to find a comma for hours that was out of school. That was space. And he's the over guy. He knows what I'm talking about. But now all the syntax is gone. We don't need to worry about it. We just put the little blocks in there, draw a line, and it's done. All the syntax is done for us. Very similar to how we, we parse all that data. 
we don't really have to worry about so much about what's happening in the background. We get that data and we can use it. Okay. Great crowd. I, I really appreciate it. Just so everybody's sleeping. I saw one head nod.